Why, hello there, and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the freshest smelling podcast this side of the internet. If you're a first-timer, you may wonder what a Pick 6 Movies is. It's a podcast, which is sort of a radio show, only on the internet, and generally produced by middle-aged men desperate to cling to just a little bit of their childhood before shuffling off this mortal coil. This particular podcast is about movies, most notably bad movies, to the tune of six per season, all of them selected because they fit the season's theme. And this season, season 20 if you can believe that, is all about movies that are most famous for being infamous. Movies that disappointed the stars, the producers, the studios, and most significantly, the viewing audience. And we have come to episode 4 of this season, that we're calling Bombs Away, and a look at one of the most notorious movies of the 2000s. A real career ender for the director and a genuine artifact of pop culture. That's right, it's the Benefer mob romantic comedy kidnapping action movie called Geely. It rhymes with really, like really, really bad. But don't take my word for it, my partner in this cinematic crime is my old pal Chad Cooper, and he's gonna take you through a bit of history, and then I'll be back to join him for a closer look at this mess of a movie. Lower the lights, and your expectations, for a look at Geely on Pick 6 Movies. Take it away, Chad! Doop doo dooby dooby doop doo doop doo dooby doop doop doo. Hello to you, Harvey the intern. Did you ever watch the uh, Nickelodeon animated series Harvey Beaks from a few years back there, Harvey? It's quite good. I think it's on Hulu. You know what? You should tell me you'll watch it after I make this recommendation and then never watch it. Because that's what I do when people recommend TV shows to me. I say I'm going to watch them and then I never do. Because I don't watch much of anything other than the terrible movies we review on this podcast. All right. Harvey, what introduction are we recording today? Ooh, Geely. Okay. All right. All right. I, I, I got it. I got it. It's, it's here. Harvey, have you watched the movie Geely? Oh, you watched it, Ed? You contributed to the introduction. Harvey, you're going places, kid. I like the cut of your jib. Now, you know, this is the movie that ended the career of one of my favorite directors. Yes, Harvey, Martin Brest. Did you think I was talking about Todd Browning or Michael Cimino? But did you just say Todd who? <sighs> Harvey, your jib's cut isn't as likable as it was just a few moments ago. Harvey, do you know Michael Cimino? <sighs> Harvey, lay down a bit of music suitable for learning something that you should already know. In 1931, director Todd Browning was riding high on the success of the film Dracula, starring Bela Lugosi. The big box office returns of that movie allowed Browning to pursue a project that he had long wanted to make. Browning was a former vaudeville performer and took an interest in a script that was being tossed around for Lon Chaney to star in that featured a French circus where a trapeze artist joins a carnival sideshow and a group of performers with a scheme to seduce and murder a dwarf to gain his inheritance. Unfortunately, Lon Chaney died in 1930, but the core idea of the story stuck with Browning. MGM was looking to tap into the horror movie craze at the time, and some executives said, Browning, get over here. Here's a sack of money. Go make a monster movie that'll scare the holy bejesus out of people and make Dracula look like a pigtail schoolgirl. Let's teach those assholes at Universal what a horror movie should look like. And so it was that Browning took his big sack of money and went forth to make the movie Freaks. To make the movie as authentic as possible, Browning cast actual sideshow performers to play the titular freaks in the movie. Film producers traveled the United States for a month looking for sideshow performers to appear in the film. This led to the casting of performers like Half Boy, Johnny Eck, a man whose body ended at the lower torso. There was also the living torso, Pierce Randian, a man with no arms or legs. Angelo Rosito, who stood 2 feet 11 inches tall. There were the conjoined twins Daisy and Violet Holton, among many other performers. So Browning started working on his movie without any real meddling from the studio, but MGM president Louis B. Mayer got wind of the project and said, What the hell kind of movie is this jackass making? Have you seen what's walking around on the back lot? Shut this picture down immediately. Fortunately, MGM production manager Irving Thalberg said, 
Look, LB, we've got to what up those shipper brains over at Universal. They've got a mummy and a Frankenstein and Dracula's running all over their backlogs. Look around you. It's terrifying. People in theaters will be so scared that utterly really piss their pants. They'll shut them too. And based on this logic, Browning was able to continue making his movie, which is infused with elements of German expressionism and an almost documentary-like approach to capturing the realism of the performers. Now, if you've never seen Freaks, you should. The plot summary where the woman tries to steal that little guy's money, that isn't in too well for her or her corresponding boyfriend. So, the studio has its first preview of Freaks, and it's brutal. Reportedly, people left screaming from the theater. There was one story that a woman suffered a miscarriage. It didn't go well. So, Thalberg realized he'd made a mistake, and they decided to make some changes to the ending of the film in the editing room. The movie was chopped down from 90 minutes to 60 minutes and removed storylines that were a little too offensive. They added a new framing device to the film's story. Despite these edits, the movie was a financial disaster with both audiences and critics equally hating the movie. Now, in an attempt to get a few bucks out of this mess of a movie, Thalberg had an idea. What if we re-edit the movie without the MGM logo, of course, and we retitle the film something like Nature's Mistakes? And we can include one of those fake science campaigns to ask, do Siamese twins have sex? Or is the half man, half woman, half man or half woman? Wait, what? I'm not the only asshole thinking of these things, am I? Of course not. Go do that thing I just said. So with the disaster of Freaks on his record, director Todd Browning never really recovered. He went from being, oh my gosh, you're the guy who made Dracula, to, oh my gosh, you're the guy who made Freaks? Browning did go on to make four more films, two of them uncredited, he was not only marked by the failure of Freaks, but reportedly, he was really disillusioned by the changes of the film industry. Talkies were taking over, and Browning didn't think the studio would want to take a chance on his vision of more personal projects. Browning didn't set out to make a movie that would end his career, but he, like many other directors, found themselves at the helm of a film that was so disastrously bad that not only made investors' money disappear, so too did the director's career. And there are quite a few examples of movie makers who made movies so bad that they were shown the exit to the Dream Factory and were never heard from again. Most notably was Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate. Cimino was fresh off of multiple box office successes, including Magnum Force, the second movie featuring Clint Eastwood as Dirty Harry, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, which also starred Eastwood and Jeff Bridges, and Chimino wrote, produced, and directed The Deer Hunter, which won five Oscars, including Best Director and Best Picture. Then Chimino made the epic western Heaven's Gate, shot on location in Montana and Idaho. The production was riddled with problems, including budget overages, reportedly running four times its original allotted budget. There were allegations of animal abuse on the set. Chimino shot over 1.3 million feet of film footage, which equals about 220 hours of footage. Chimino edited this down to a rough cut that ran five hours, 25 minutes. Executives at United Artists said, This is bullshit. Fire this asshole Chimino. Get me five editors here, 10 pots of coffee, and call my guy and tell him we need a little wake up powder. You know what you mean. Chimino said, Look, I, I can edit this down to a cool three hours, 39 minutes, which he did. And the movie opened, and everybody hated the film. Critics, audiences, people who prefer their movies to be at least four hours long. Chimino's career was tarnished as the details of this classic box office bomb became more public. Chimino was able to direct a handful of movies after Heaven's Gate, but none of them matched the success of his early career. Other successful directors encountered similar career headwinds after releasing movies that bombed at the box office. Director Roland Joffe's first film, The Killing Fields, was nominated for seven Oscars, receiving a Best Director nod for Joffe. He followed that with The Mission, which also had seven Oscar nominations, again one for Best Director. Joffe said in an interview that during this time he met with Orson Welles, who asked Joffe, So, what do you do now? And Wells laughed in a way that only someone who intimately knew Joffe's place in life could laugh. Joffe then went on to direct Patrick Swayze in City of Joy about the poverty in the slums of India. That movie didn't do so well at the box office, but it didn't have the oomph to completely derail his career. Then Joffe produced the 1993 video game adaptation of Super Mario Brothers, but he was only producer, so he's down, but he's not out. And then Joffe directed Patrick Swayze's co-star from the movie Ghost, aka Demi Moore, and Gary Oldman in the 
adaptation of the novel All High Schoolers Are Forced to Read, The Scarlet Letter. A movie adaptation that was so bad, it almost ended multiple careers, and one of them was Roland Joppy. Joffe did go on to direct seven more movies, but none of them were met with the critical success of his studio-backed films in his earlier works. The Wachowskis' success with the original Matrix trilogy allowed them to make Speed Racer and then Cloud Atlas, which was followed by Jupiter Ascending, a movie that stopped their careers until the most recent Matrix sequel slash reboot with Keanu Reeves. John McTiernan directed Predator, Die Hard, Die Hard with a Vengeance, A Hunt for Red October, and then he made Rollerball, a remake of the 1975 James Caan movie about high-stakes roller derby. But this version starred Chris Klein, LL Cool J, and Rebecca Romaine. It bombed and took out John McTiernan's career with it. But there is one constant throughout all of these directorial careers. They had a lot of success before a mostly abrupt ending. And this path of successful filmmaking, meeting an unexpected ending, is no better exemplified than by the career of one of Hollywood's most underappreciated directors, Martin Brest. Martin Brest was born in the Bronx and earned a Master's of Fine Arts from the AFI Conservatory in 1971. Martin Brest started his career making short films, one titled Hot Dogs for Gauguin, featuring a young Danny DeVito as a photographer who wants to blow up the Statue of Liberty so he can get a photo that will make him famous. This movie also marked the screen debut of Rhea Perlman, aka Danny DeVito's wife. This led to Brest's first feature film that he wrote and directed called Going in Style, which came out in 1979. This movie starred George Burns, Art Carney, and Lee Strasberg as three senior citizens who decide to rob a bank to break up the monotony of their day-to-day -day lives. The movie is funny and touching and explores the challenges of growing old. Brest was then hired to direct the 1983 movie War Games, starring Matthew Broderick and Ali Sheedy, but he got fired after 12 days of filming because of disagreements with the producers. Reportedly, Brest had a darker tone for the movie than what was ultimately delivered in theaters. One door closes, another one opens, and Brest was hired to direct Eddie Murphy in Beverly Hills Cop. That movie was huge, created two sequels, neither of which Brest directed. Four years after Beverly Hills Cop, Brest directed the film Midnight Run, starring Robert De Niro and Charles Grodin. If you haven't seen that movie, shame on you. It's one of the best road trip comedies of all time. It's funny and touching and just a hell of a good ride. Four years later, Martin Brest followed up Midnight Run with the film Scent of a Woman, starring Al Pacino, who won his first Oscar playing the blind, retired Lieutenant Colonel Frank Slade. A young Chris O'Donnell and a young Philip Seymour Hoffman star in this movie as well. That film made $131 million off of a budget of $31 million and was widely praised by audiences and critics alike, despite its two and a half hour runtime. Harvey the Intern, you seen Midnight Run and Scent of a Woman? <laughs> that's, that's my boy. I tell you, that Jib's cut is suddenly looking a little bit better over there, Harvey. <laughs> Martin Brest took a little longer, six years to be exact, between the success of Scent of a Woman and his next film, which was a remake of the 1934 movie Death Takes a Holiday. This adaptation was titled Meet Joe Black and starred Brad Pitt, Anthony Hopkins, and Marcia Gay Harden in a story about the Grim Reaper, aka Death, who takes the human form of a young man named Joe Black. Harvey the Intern, have you seen Meet Joe Black? Yes, I agree, 100%. You are hard pressed to find a movie that kills a guy with multiple cars in grander fashion than Meet Joe Black. Let's keep going. The movie was released and it didn't perform as well as Scent of a Woman. And on its opening weekend, it came out third at the box office behind Adam Sandler's The Waterboy and the second weekend of I Still Know What You Did Last Summer. That all makes sense for American movie-going audiences. When the movie was released, it included the first trailer for Star Wars, Episode One: The Phantom Menace, so a notable percentage of its opening haul was driven by soon-to-be-disappointed movie nerds. The biggest complaint about Meet Joe Black was its runtime of three hours, and the movie does have a slow burn to the film's narrative. The movie didn't do so well in the United States, but it made its money back in the overseas markets. I'm a Meet Joe Black apologist. I like that movie. And over the span of five movies, Martin Brest directed George Burns, Art Carney, Lee Strasberg, Eddie Murphy, Robert DiDiro, Charles Grodin, Al Pacino, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Brad Pitt, and Anthony Hopkins. 
that's some amazing star power across five incredible movies. And then came Geely. Geely hit theaters in August of 2003, riding a wave of bad buzz before one frame of the movie hit screens in America. Where do we start with Geely? Well, in November of 2002, almost a year prior to the film's release, the movie's two leads, Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez, got engaged after starting a romantic relationship earlier that year. The media dubbed them <laughs> Benifer. Remember when like People Magazine and Entertainment Tonight mashed up celebrity names to make a cute name like Brangelina and Tomcat? I just, I feel so gross saying those words out loud. Look, just to set the stage when this movie came out in Ben Affleck's career, he had already done a string of Kevin Smith movies, including Mallrats, Chasing Amy, and Dogma. Affleck had won an Oscar for writing Good Will Hunting. That's right, his first of two Oscars. He nabbed another one for Argo in 2013. Think about it, Ben Affleck has two Academy Awards and Al Pacino has one. <laughs> Where do we live? Ben Affleck starred in Armageddon, see season 11, episode six of Pick Six Movies on that film. And he also was in the almost unwatchable Pearl Harbor. He had taken a turn as Jack Ryan in the Tom Clancy novel adaptation, Some of All Fears. He was Matt Murdock in the early bad Marvel movie, Daredevil, starring alongside Jon Favreau, AKA Iron Man's chauffeur, Happy Hogan, in those recent good Marvel movies. Ben Affleck was an actor who could carry a movie. Jennifer Lopez went from being a backup dancer on In Living Color to playing Selena in the biographical film Selena. This led to roles in movies like Anaconda, see season 16, episode four, pick six movies for more on that one. She starred alongside George Clooney in Out of Sight and maintained growing popularity as a musical performer. Dramatic success in The Cell and Enough and comedic performances in romantic comedies like The Wedding Planner with Matthew McConaughey and Made in Manhattan with Rafe Fiennes. Who put him in a romantic comedy? I'm sorry. <laughs> She showed off a range of roles and she had real box office appeal. Plus when The Wedding Planner came out, her second album, J-Lo, was the number one album. She was a pop culture icon. And then 2003 showed up. Her relationship with Ben Affleck was tabloid trash and she was perceived as being a diva. So much so that she and Ben Affleck made their way onto an episode of South Park that featured the hit song, Taco Flavored Kisses For My Ben. This episode of South Park debuted in April of 2003, four months before Geely landed in theaters. People were already lampooning the couple and looking for any excuse to throw a punch at them. And then Geely showed up in movie theaters. Now we're gonna discuss this movie in way too much detail when Bo gets here in a few minutes. So I'll save my thoughts on the movie's plot and characters and execution as a piece of entertainment until he arrives. But I will say this, Ben Affleck's performance as the titular Geely is truly one of the most unlikable characters ever captured on film. He's homophobic, misogynistic, he bullies the mentally handicapped. That's right, one of the main three characters in this movie is mentally disabled. Martin Brest worked at a state hospital in the Bronx and he used this experience as inspiration for the character Brian in the movie Geely. Brian is played by Justin Bartha, who I know as Doug, the guy that disappeared in all those Hangover movies. Well, he disappeared in the first one. I don't think I saw the second or third one. In Geely, his performance is, as one critic called it, outrageously offensive in just about every aspect. And I agree. There are some special guest appearances by actors who shouldn't be in this movie. Stick around for that. The film is just bad, but why is it bad? Martin Bress made five fantastic movies. Then came this. Some reports say that Martin Bress got into it with the production company, which led to them taking over creative control. This led to rewrites, reshoots, and re-edits. Despite all of this, the movie is known as one of the worst films of all time. Geely cost $75 million to make, and it pulled in 7.2 million bucks at the box office. Not a lot of money, but what you need to know is that the studio pulled the movie from theaters after its third week of distribution. Martin Brest has not written or directed a movie since Geely came out. And after the disastrous reception of Geely back in 2003, Martin Brest disappeared from public life altogether. 
And it wasn't until July of 2021 that Martin Bress made a public appearance at a screening of Midnight Run and Beverly Hills Cop, where during the intermission between the two films, he was interviewed by filmmaker Paul Thomas Anderson at the Arrow Theater in Los Angeles. The two iconic directors discussed their craft and shared admiration for each other's work to a theater filled with fans of Martin Brest's work. It was Brest's first public return after the release of his most notoriously bad film, and that night marked the first time that Martin Brest viewed Midnight Run in over 20 years. Martin Brest said of the experience of watching Midnight Run with an audience, I realized when I was watching it, I was paying off a childhood debt. My mother took me to see Mad Mad World when I was 11, and it was my only cultural experience at that time. I never saw plays or anything, and there was this moment where before they went to the first intermission, it was parallel action and tons of comedic characters to keep the audience charged while they're all getting popcorn. Intercutting all the different stories and the score started to swoon, I felt an ecstatic religious experience of comedic glee. And seeing it here after not seeing it for all those years is kind of full circle. Martin Bress has made no public statement on any plans for future films, but if he does return, I'll be one of the first people to buy a ticket to see what he's been working on for all these years. But seeing as that likely isn't to happen anytime soon, what say we get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to see what all this stink is about when it comes to this infamously bad movie? Ladies and gentlemen, Benefers and Jafflex alike, we proudly present the 2003 Martin Breast classic, Geely. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I'm joined by the guy they call, when I can't get the job done, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing this evening? Yeah, it's pronounced Bowley. Kind of rhymes with bowl, <laughs> only with a, an E on the end. I understand that you didn't enjoy John Carter. I get that. But to turn around and do this... <laughs> it's an arms race. I had never seen this before. Obviously, I'd always heard of Geely. I don't know that I ever would have seen it had we not done it for the show, which I suppose is kind of the point. But it really was <laughs> sort of jaw dropping of like, oh, this was the guy who did it Midnight Run. Like, you can see that in the mm -hmm. DNA of this movie. Absolutely. But it's like somebody clunked him on the head with a brick. <laughs> or something according to your introduction i'm curious what changed like where did this go wrong well he wrote it i understand that he didn't write those other movies well he wrote his first movie he wrote going in style yeah but then maybe you're a good director you're just not a very good writer we call that tim burton syndrome yes <laughs> I take it you did not like this movie. I don't know how I feel about this movie. It is so head scratching. I didn't hate it. It was like one of those love the sinner, hate the sin. You know how religious hypocrites are prone to say? Because there are parts of this movie that are just so bad that it almost feels intentional. You're like springtime for Hitler bad. It's like somebody put two or three other movies into a blender and pureed that together. Yes. And out came Geely. One of the reviews i read of it i've found very funny and also very accurate is it can offend any segment of the population men women gay lesbians the mentally ill italians whoever it is represented in this movie is getting the short end of the stick somehow and not just the short end of the stick not even like well this is just underrepresented it is offensive it's not Faust, whatever the hell that tagline for that movie back. It's not that offensive. It's offensive in a different way, where it's just like, oh, that's not how people like this behave. It's like Martin Brest hadn't ever really met gay people before and had only watched Chasing Amy and was mm -hmm. like, what if that but the mob? And Rain Man. And Midnight Run. <laughs> right. If you put all of those together, and by the way, how about that one scene from True Romance with Christopher Walken? Can we get a little dribble-drabble of that in here as well? I thought it was more of the scene from Pulp Fiction with Christopher Walken. But we'll get there. This movie has so many unexpected twists and turns. There are guest appearances by actors who should not be in this movie that show up in this movie. If you've never seen Geely, just stop right 
right now. Go on Hulu. I think it's free there, at least at the time of this recording. Watch it. You both will and won't be disappointed. I promise you. It's unlike anything I'd ever seen before. I would take some issue with that. I would say if you have never watched Geely, listen to this. You will get what you need out of it. And if you want to watch the Christopher Walken scene, I'm not going to talk you out of that. It's one of those things of just like, hey, Christopher Walken, how about you just go vamp for a few minutes? We're getting ahead of ourselves. Our movie starts off. And we get that peppy electric keyboard based jazz that was used in a lot of movies from this time period. It's kind of like good walking music for a comedic lead that kind of like. We're in for a good time, Bo. The music then stops. You're like, whoa, 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 what happened? And Ben Affleck, as the titular Geely in voiceover, says, Hey, you see, after all is said and done, the only thing you can really be sure of, I mean, the only thing you can really count on in this world is you never fucking know. Let me just say right now, I have a lot of fondness for Ben Affleck, woefully miscast in this movie. Does not belong in this part at all. I do not care for Ben Affleck in most everything, and this may be the most perfect role for him, because he's bad, the writing's bad, it's just bad wrapped up in bad with bad sauce on top of it. And the whole speech is one of those, when you were tying your shoes today, did you think for one second that those shoes would be untied by the coroner? Are, are, you, are you talking to me? Like, what do you know? <laughs> right. I, I, well, <laughs> but then the camera shows that he's talking not to us, the audience, but he is talking to some guy that he has put into a dryer at a public laundromat. Mm -hmm. It's this middle-aged bald guy with a mustache. He's got a gag in his mouth. Ben Affleck says, the human body is 80% water. If I run this dryer, it will extract all that water and leave 30 full pounds of skin and teeth and bones. So, uh, you got that money? You owe my boss, Lewis? <laughs> my favorite part of this scene is when somebody comes through the door and Ben Affleck just wheels on him and is like, hey, you want to know about this? How about you get the fuck out of here? Take it to a dry cleaner but i like i like the question you want to know about this <laughs> it implies a very dark like almost hellraiser-esque like we have such sights to show you kind of thing right he locks the guy in the dryer he's like oh look at this i got no change to start this dryer thereby sucking the moisture out of you as i just described he asked the guy for some change he's like i got the money he's like i only need change for a dollar he's like no 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 tell lewis i've got most of his money we cut to lewis as played by a time traveling gym brewer from the year 2033 <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's actually some guy named Lenny Venito, who has a long career of playing characters named Vinny and Tony and Anthony and Lil Tony and Fat Tony and Dom and a guy from New York. You're right. It is Jim Brewer. Although I think you're giving him too much credit. Have you seen Jim Brewer lately? I saw him on January 6th, I think. It was more of a crowd shot, though. It was like the Where's Waldo <laughs> of January 6th. There's Jim Brewer. You like some ACDC? Yeah, Jim. Do the goat. Eh. Talk about your dad shitting himself some more. <laughs> also, worth pointing out, this is all about a bunch of mobsters in Los Angeles. New York mobsters in Los Angeles. Which, <laughs> at no point does anyone explain how the hell this situation happened. Dude, that's the least of our worries. We cut over to Lewis, and he's walking around this outdoor seating at a restaurant somewhere in the greater Los Angeles area. And Lewis, he's dressed in such a way that he really looks like he should be working back of house day shift at a pizzeria. Or he should be going to party with Vince Vaughn and John Favreau from Swingers. Lewis is talking to some guy in a gray suit. Forget about it. Bada bing. Ben Affleck, he walks over and Lewis is still prattling away in his native tongue. He's like, Gabagool, chicken papa shine. <laughs> Give me my money. I'm going to send Jiggly over there to, to put two in your brain. Forget about it. Get out of here, you putz schmuck. Bada bing. It's actually pronounced Jiggly. You know, it's uh, sort of like uh, really, but Jiggly. Also rhymes with wheelie. Uh, I don't think no other words rhyme with wheelie and Jiggly. I guess if I were cutting potatoes, I would want to give them a peely first before I maybe diced them into some french fries or something. Shut the fuck up. You, wait, you got my money? I got some of your money. I mean, not, not every last dime or nothing. But, uh, Sub, you got some of the money. Look, if you get some of the money, then you go and you break the guy's leg. You send the message. You're supposed to be this vicious mad dog. Bada bing. Let's go take a walk using me, all right? Look, I, I understand that you're a little upset with me right now, but... Upset? I don't have all my money. Look, I got this guy. He's causing me trouble, all right? I need to convince this guy to rethink the error of his ways. This individual has a relative with psychological defects. I want you to go and get his relative and maybe reason will prevail. 
Capiche? Gabagool? Bada bing! What about this guy? Do I need to know anything special about him? Like, just get in your car and go get the guy with the special defects. All right. And so he goes straight to, and hand it to the movie, I guess, for getting started, goes straight to this adult care home where he is led on a tour to uh, the character Brian, who is, is sort of the second of our trio of main characters. Yeah, and it is a it is a home for adults yes. that need assistance in their day-to-day lives and just a place for them to live. You know, I mean, it's basically people who are not able to care for themselves. If you watch this movie like Bo and I did, not knowing what it's all about, this is the first of many moments where you will ask yourself, what is going on here? Like we're five minutes into this movie and it takes a hard left-hand turn into a room of adults that have varying degrees of mental capabilities or ability to communicate or to feed themselves. It's the first real, uh uh-oh, moment of the movie. (laughs) Oh, this is probably not going to be handled as tastefully as I might like. Ben Affleck walks over to Brian. I'm not sure what this character's diagnosis is supposed to be. It appears to be a mix of autism and Tourette's with other neurological disorders. And this character portrayal is a lot like Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man, combined with Crispin Glovin and everything that he was ever in. He's all spastic and he's constantly rocking. He has bald fists. He doesn't make eye contact. He has this hiccup laughter. He's spontaneously raps and dances it's somehow more offensive than radio but it's in that ballpark is it more offensive than radio i think so because no it's not man you haven't seen radio (laughs) when radio's yelling (laughs) in the radio thinking he can talk to people and stuff it no there is a sweetness to this character that doesn't prey on your emotion what are you talking about compared to radio yeah i mean it's the same character only this one raps and gives shout outs to the people from his adult care home upon repeat viewing uh-huh. despite this uncomfortable portrayal of brian and it is uncomfortable yes. i submit that brian is the smartest and most sophisticated character in this whole movie because ben affleck walks over to brian and he says hey yo uh, you brian i mean i know you're brian your friend ratted you out over there you know i say things like ratted out because i'm from new york forget about it what are you eating there poly seeds i say poly seeds instead of sesame seeds because you know from new york forget about it and brian looks up at ben affleck and he says these are sunflower seeds they're not poly seeds and you must be the stupidest person pisshead piss fucker that's actual dialogue from the movie obviously we're not going to try to go anywhere near an impression of how actor justin bartha sounds i think i'm doing a spot on impression of justin bartha as brian it's pretty close ben affleck is like hey you coming with me you little freak and grabs him and starts to pull him out of the, sh- the chair hey, uh, sir i have to go to the baywatch not baywatch the Baywatch. I repeat, I have to go to the Baywatch. Ben Affleck says, you want to watch Baywatch? Let's go to my apartment. All right, we'll turn it on. Forget about it. I was about to go to the Baywatch right now. It's so crazy that you say that. How about you come with me? You are the stupidest person. Not television. The Baywatch. Can I go to the Baywatch? Again, actual dialogue. Let me get my radio and then we can leave. And so that's what he does. He grabs his portable radio and they take off. Because if you didn't need to be reminded by the movie Radio at this point, he is actually going to say the word radio to make you remember that there is a movie called Radio and that is also terrible. If you had mentioned Radio, I would have never thought about Radio again. That's how it should be. I will never be able to get out of my head the line that Ed Harris has about, we weren't teaching Radio. Radio was teaching us. It is one of the single worst bits of dialogue I've ever seen in any movie ever and I can't get it out of my skull. I may have never seen radio. You should not. We will never do it because that's all there is to the movie radio is there. there's a mentally handicapped person that isn't being taught. He's the one doing the teaching. The musical score at this moment in the movie is this assortment of stringed instruments to let the audience know that Ben Affleck is connecting emotionally with Brian, although he's really not. The music in this movie constantly tells you how to feel without having to pay for songs from the 70s and 80s or 90s to help set the mood. It's crazy because the characters have no reason to relate or bond at this point but you're right if there is that swell of strings where you're like wait a second are they trying to emotionally manipulate me when absolutely nothing that the characters have said or done justifies any of this (laughs) they go to the car and brian is like i thought we were going to the baywatch where is the baywatch reach in the uh the glove box there hand me that flashlight Eh, i mean telephone hold up Eh, hello hello Uh, what 
Uh, the Baywatch is closed today. Ah, shit. We'll have to go tomorrow. Sorry, Brian. Click. He immediately assumes that Brian won't know the difference between a giant police issue flashlight and a telephone. And he doesn't. Also, Justin Bartha's performance, I mentioned earlier, it's a whole lot like Hoffman's performance in Rain Man. But when he said he was he wanted to go to the Baywatch, I placed a bet that the Baywatch was going to be representative of something else. The way that the word Rain Man was a mispronunciation of the word Raymond. Oh, that would have been good. And it's also here that i was like wait a minute is this a prequel to midnight run because the music as i mentioned is very similar mm -hmm. we got all these hard-nosed new yorkers tracking down a guy and kidnapping him as leverage in a court case i'm surprised robert de niro did not play the brian character in this movie by the way not the first time he would have played someone with a, a mental handicap what else he what awakenings and also there was that movie flawless that he did with philip seymour hoffman yeah, I didn't see that either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Ben Affleck pulls out his real phone and he calls up his boss and his boss feels a whole lot like Joey Pants in Midnight Run. And Ben Affleck calls him up and he says, I got the Duke. I mean, I got Brian. I'll call, I'll call you later. Bada bing. One time, has anyone ever walked through that door with a complaint about me sending people on jobs to kidnap mentally handicapped people? <laughs> not one, not one time. I'm going to go get some donuts. You want some donuts? When they hang up the phone, Lenny is eating his lunch at this outdoor restaurant and he just stares off in the distance for like 15 seconds. There's a lot of staring in this movie. And then he just kind of thinks quietly about how much of a screw up Ben Affleck is. And then he dials another number to call in some backup. Spoilers, it's Jalen. We don't know why Ben Affleck is kidnapping Brian at this point. Other than Lewis has asked him to do it, yeah. Brian provides leverage for something to happen regarding somebody else. They don't tell us that for a while. Ben Affleck and Brian, they get to his apartment where the majority of our movie takes place. <laughs> yeah, this movie, aside from the salaries of Ben Affleck and J-Lo, probably cost about $4,000 to make. It cost them $75 million plus to make this movie. And I don't know where the money went. Ben Affleck, J-Lo, the cameos. You're giving $5 million to Pacino, 3 to Walken. It's bonkers. 30 to J-Lo and Ben Affleck. But that still leaves you $30 million to make this movie, and that seems excessive. They get in the apartment, and Ben Affleck says, You thirsty? You want a water? I give you a water. So we get to Brian drinking a glass of tap water, and Brian says, I want to go home. And Ben Affleck says, eh, That's not happening. Uh, whoa, you want to watch cartoons or something? Don't you do that, motherfucker. I'm going to the Baywatch. Where are my sunflower seeds? And then there's a knock at the door. There are so many knocks at the door. It's like watching an old Bob Hope Christmas special. Where it'd be like, hey, <laughs> like, hey, somebody's at the door. Let's go. This is my Bob Hope. Hey, somebody. <laughs> hey, who's at the door? Let's go. Hey, everybody. Look who the cat dragged in. It's me. Your pal Dino. Bob, what are you doing here at this ski chalet? I just, you know, practicing my putting and uh, having a little festive time. Hold on a second. <laughs> I choose out the door. <laughs> hey, it's uh, all pro NFL player, uh, Rosie Greer. Rosie, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, what? I heard Dean Martin was going to be here and uh, wherever he goes. So we get our first knock at the door, of which there are many. Ben Affleck answers it, and it's J-Lo, clearly having just left a very expensive hair salon. She shows up looking like she's on her way to walk a red carpet at an event where black leather pants, a low-cut, long sleeve belly shirt is not only encouraged, but it's required. <laughs> and when he answers the door, Ben Affleck immediately goes from annoyed to horny. What can I do for you, pretty lady? Can I use your phone? Uh, I've got something that requires me to use your phone. I'll be in and out real quick, okay? And I'll only leave a faint scent. Which means she's going to fart before she leaves. Yeah, and he's like, well, I don't know. This ain't such a good time, but... Come on. I, come on. Oh, I mean, you do have that come on. big badonga donk. How about you get on in here? That's what I thought you'd say. And also, J-Lo is very charming in this movie, as she is in many other films. We talked about this in Anaconda, and she's good. It's just that the script is so bad. We'll get to it. There is the yoga scene where she gets a chance to shine, and it's 
jaw dropping. So he introduces himself. He's like, hey, I'm Ben Affleck. Uh, what is your name? If I might be so bold. Oh, I'm JLo. And he's like, oh, that is great. And then in comes Brian. And he's like, <clears throat> it seems we have company, Ben Affleck. Who is your new friend here? Also, I am going to the Baywatch. Lest anyone forget, I am going to the Baywatch. And JLo asks him, so what's your name? And Ben Affleck chimes in. Hey, this guy, uh, it's Bob. It's my buddy Bob. And Brian says, excuse me. My name is not Bob, you sick son of a bitch. My name is Brian. The way he puts it, the actual light is, you're stupid. Which is pretty funny. Like him calling Ben Affleck stupid really made me laugh. <laughs> JLo looks at Brian and says, well, you are very handsome. Hey, Ben Affleck, can I talk to you in private for a minute? Ben Affleck follows JLo into the bedroom. And as he passes Brian, he's like, whoa, you're like a babe magnet. You're better than a fucking dog. Forget about it. I'm going to get laid. Brian says, you're a dog. You're a dog head piss fart. Again, actual dialogue from our movie. With their out of earshot, JLo says, you know, I heard you were a fuck up, but I'm actually genuinely surprised at what a fuck up you are. Hey, well, what happened? I thought we were going to get down and do a little gabagoo. And she's like, I'm actually here because Lewis sent me because he doesn't trust you because of what a fuck up you are. What did he fuck up? He went to this adult home by some miracle, walked out with an adult male Without any questions, he got Brian. He brought him to the apartment. Like, and, and if he's such a fuck up, why did Lewis hire him for the job in the first place? Yeah, and that's the question he asked later. And even then, uh, Lewis says, I was in a rush. What did you want me to do? I needed somebody to act fast. I wasn't thinking. Ben Affleck does call Lewis and he says, hey, Lewis, bada bing. Uh, there's a smoking hot piece of ass. Oh, my God. God, trying to tell me that you think I'm a fuck up. And Lewis says, look, look, this is the thing, all right? Yeah, you, you too big of a jerk off, Ben Affleck, all right? You watch her, she watches you, all right? That's what's going to happen, all right? Bada bing, bada boom, goodbye. So after he gets this confirmation, Ben Affleck pretends that he's still having a conversation with him. He's like, okay, all right, yeah, you take care too. No, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. Okay, I'll talk to you later, Lewis. All right, bye-bye. J-Lo is like, well, since we're all going to be in this together and we have the, our three leads of the movie all, all in one room now, how about you get me something to drink? I don't know who the fuck you think you are. You come in here asking for tea? You don't know my reputation. I'm the Sultan of Slick. I'm the rule of fucking cool. You want to be a gangster or a thug? You sit at my feet and gather pearls that emulate forth from me. I'm the original straight foremost pimp mac hustler original gangsta's gangsta also actual dialogue from the movie you think gloria steinem ever saw this if she did she didn't see all of it there <laughs> there's at least two scenes that she would have walked out on she didn't make it past the yoga oh no 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 j-lo says i'm gonna go get my stuff and then brian chimes in and says ben affleck how many cups of spit do you swallow every day? Which is this movie's version of The Human Head Weighs 8 Pounds from Jerry Maguire, which is a ripoff of Bruce McCullough's Gavin on Kids in the Hall. Uh -huh. My mom says if there's a depression, I'll have to enter a dance marathon. <laughs> ben Affleck, the hero of our movie, then starts shoving Brian against the wall as if he's about to beat this poor kid's ass. He starts screaming, hey, why don't you shut the fuck up? Brian says, hmm, you're an idiot. Ben Affleck <laughs> just starts shoving him and stuff. And J-Lo comes back in and is like, hey, 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 what, is, what the fuck is happening in here? She goes, look, I don't know what's happening, but if you keep smacking this kid around, I'm going to kill you. Oh, here we go. You're going to kill me? Go ahead. And then Brian chimes in with, I believe I would estimate that it's 35 cups of spit. JLo never really gets above a three or four on the scale of how rattled she gets in these circumstances. She's got this Zen quality that we'll talk about a bit more. But this is the first example of it where she is completely level headed in all circumstances, even at a point where she probably shouldn't. Yeah. And she says to him, like, look, we've all got to be here together. How about we just try to make this pleasant? We'll be cool like Fonzie. <laughs> Who is cool? Tell me who's cool. Fonzie's cool. Correcto mundo. 
They're all sitting around eating dinner. JLo's having her tea. Ben Affleck and Brian are munching on some microwave dinners, and there's some banter between Ben Affleck and JLo, who tells them that her real name isn't JLo, aka Ricky. Mm. And so that's a little mystery for us both. And then Brian says, This food isn't very good. I'm hungry. And then Ben Affleck just gets real violent and screams, Eat your food, stupid! <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I don't think you should have the hero of your movie calling the mentally handicapped character stupid. J-Lo is like, hey, 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 this isn't his fault. And we also get our first use of the now known R word of the movie, which there are a couple of choice moments where somebody calls Brian retarded. They don't call him retarded. They call him retard. That's true. Ben Affleck is like, hey, 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 how about you back off me too, J-Lo? I mean, look, in every relationship, there are a bull and a cow. And in this relationship, I am the bull. You are the cow. <laughs> I don't think in the history of forever that a man referring to a woman as a cow ended well. No, no, no. Unless maybe it was one of them furries, like from... Uh, Pottersville? One of them Pottersville cows. No. <laughs> You can't call a woman a cow. <laughs> Not unless they are specifically dressed as a cow. Like at Halloween or if they work at a dairy and they're the mascot. Yeah, but even then you're on thin ice. Like you want to pick your battles for there for sure. I think you need to go with proper names. It's Bessie. <laughs> for sure. Also still <laughs> dicey, I feel. Like it's real, <laughs> real thin ice. But then Brian says, listen, I don't know if this was clear earlier, but I would like to go home now. Eat your food. You can't go home. <laughs> How are you going to go see the Baywatch tomorrow if you go home, you stupid? Hmm. You make a good point. We are going to the Baywatch tomorrow. I don't know if you've all heard or not, but I am going to the Baywatch. I shall stay here overnight. Let's see what happens when the sun comes up tomorrow. And so Ben Affleck puts Brian to bed. He, like, gives him a couch. He's like, hey, this is real comfortable. I mean, I know it ain't a bed or nothing, but it's going to be good to sleep on. Don't even worry about it. Brian says, well, I have to tell you, before I go to bed, I like someone to read to me. It helps me settle down. Ben Affleck is like, I'm not going to fucking read to you. Please, please read to me, Ben Affleck. It, it soothes me. It helps me to wind down from the, the chaos of the day. And J-Lo is like, yeah, you, you really should read to him. And then Ben Affleck, in the least surprising line of the movie, is like, hey, I don't really have any books around here or nothing. Magazines, <laughs> newspapers, takeout menu. I don't really have anything. Anything that might be a link to information outside my own head. I don't have none of that. <laughs> He ends up picking up a bottle of Tabasco sauce and reads the label and the ingredients for about 20 seconds, which appeases Brian. Mm. Hmm. Thank you very much. This is a moment that could work in a better movie with a better actor and a better script. And if it were a single mom's kid, as opposed to a mentally handicapped person you had kidnapped. <laughs> let's let's not forget the dynamic at work at, at the root of all this. I'm not forgetting any of this. Brian has sleepy eyes now and he says, oh, thank you. Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck turns off the lights. Then Ben Affleck says to J-Lo, you know what? You're right. We should make the best of a bad situation there. <laughs> what, uh, what say you come in and sleep in bed next to me? Well, okay. Purely on a professional basis, you and I can share the same bed. That is fine. Cut to him looking in a mirror, chatting himself up where he's like, how about this bull here, huh? Take a look at this bull. He's flexing his muscles. And just getting all pumped up. Bull cow. I'm the bull. The bull. The bears. I'm everything. Look at me. Look at my crazy tattoos. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to do something to that cow. He's giving himself a couple of strokes, you know, so that when he whips off his underwear, he looks a little bigger than he really is. <laughs> J-Lo's in bed wearing these purple pajamas and she's reading a copy of Being Peace by Thich Nhat Han, uh -huh. which includes the principles of Buddhist teachings. I have a copy of this book. Oh, that's nice. Ben Affleck walks out of the bathroom and he's dressed in a silky red robe like Hugh Hefner <laughs> with his chest exposed. And he drops the robe to reveal like his poorly tattooed biceps and all of his fur. And he climbs into bed next to J-Lo. And all of this is really played for laughs. It's just not funny at all. Yeah. Ben Affleck, he kind of rolls over to J-Lo and he says, hey, you know, you're a very attractive woman. Look, I don't want to allow the seeds of cruel hope to sprout in your soul. Hey, you know I don't read. What are you talking about? I I'm, I'm not your type. What do you mean you're not my type? Like, what about you is not my type or vice versa? Mm -hmm. 
first off, you have a penis, and I'm gay. I'm a lesbian. And she turns out the light, rolls over, and goes to sleep. This is the second or third moment in this movie where you're like, wait, what? Yeah. That wasn't in the trailer. I felt like this was a thing I knew about the movie going into it. I had somewhere down the line by some kind of crazy osmosis, I had learned that this is a movie in which Jennifer Lopez is playing a lesbian and Ben Affleck is trying to get with her. Ben Affleck had already starred in Chasing Amy, a movie that explored the relationship between a lesbian and a straight guy who sort of fall in love. Look, sexuality is not binary for some people. But both Chasing Amy and especially this movie try to explore the complexities of sexuality in such a ham-fisted way that it's more insulting than enlightening. That is the biggest problem with this movie is that I feel like its heart is kind of in the right place in terms of exploring, like you said, kind of painting sexuality as something that is on the spectrum. There's masculine and feminine, and that can reside in the body of a man as well as the body of a woman. And there's interesting stuff about the reversal of gender roles in this movie and that kind of thing. But it's just so poorly handled that, like you said, it just comes across as being offensive to anyone that might identify as anything other than really a corpse. I think that's the only person that... <laughs> Would not be offended at, by something in this movie. But then we get, Chad, to the moment in this movie where my jaw was on the floor. Where Brian is up early and is making a phone call to hear some weather reports. Uh, that'll be a thing we'll learn about more. He's calling and the voice he's listening to has an Australian accent and gives him the weather for Sydney or Melbourne or brisbane or some other city in australia those are the only three that i can mm -hmm. think of ben affleck walks in and he's like who the fuck are you talking to and he grabs a phone and listens and he hears you know good day good day you know how much this cost and brian says five dollars <laughs> ten dollars no it's not five dollars you crazy little nut uh, you're stupid and then jennifer lopez rolls in affleck is like hey listen i just wanted to say you know about last night and, uh, no hard feelings or nothing right you got one shot with me but after that i'm out so that ship has sailed unless you wanted to come back then it might come back but right now you snoozed you lose and then chad hey everybody somebody's at the door go get it i'm gonna get another drink <laughs> it's me christopher walken i'm back ben affleck goes to the door he looks at the people and he goes, ah, oh, geez, it's a cap. He opens it. Christopher Walken steps into our movie. And when this happened, all I thought is Bo is going to be so happy right now. Like, I didn't even know he was invited to the movie. I was delighted. And then the more he hams it up, which he does in this scene, something fierce. I don't think he had scripted dialogue. I, I totally agree. I think it was like, here's what you need to get across in this scene is that you're on the hunt for the relation of a district attorney. You got it, baby. I can do all of that. All right? One take walking. That's what they call me. Or at least that's what they call me on this set. All right, people. Let's do it. I got 15 minutes, and then I'm going to go gonna go get a Reuben and take a nap. Through the course of this scene, you do learn that, hey, Brian is the younger brother of a district attorney. But the way Walken puts it is like, <laughs> so they said that... This boy has gone missing. Now, I think it's probably alien abduction, but on the off chance that you know something about this, I thought I might come by. His first line of dialogue when he walks in, he says, your, your door, it's, it's not thick enough. And you're not home when you're home. <laughs> what? He says, I'm on this unsolvable case. Your friend, Lewis has a boss back in New York and he's about to fold his napkin. Starkman in New York. He's tough, but you know, he's a good guy. And this federal prosecutor who's got Starkman's testicular matter clenched in his fist. Any of this sound familiar? It, like this is the dialogue. He's just yeah. chipper shredding words, hoping that it comes out in some sort of connective tissue of an idea. Ben Affleck, of course, is like, 
no, I don't know nothing about this. And then an egg timer goes off off camera to let Walken know that he is contractually no longer obligated to be in this scene. He goes, all right, fine. Listen, how about you come with me? I'm going to go down to Marie Callender's, get a big bowl of pie. Mm, mm, good. Put some on your head. Your tongue would slap your brains out trying to get to it. What? What has just happened in this movie? Affleck says, nah, I'm trying to get in shape. Then, Bo, Christopher Walken is standing at the door. He pauses and looks at Ben Affleck for... 20 minutes? It feels like half an hour. And then he just goes, all right. (laughs) And he leaves the movie and we never see him again. The most shocking thing about this was that he disappears from the movie entirely like a ghost. It's the second craziest cameo in this movie because Walken, I once heard someone say that Christopher Walken is the relief pitcher for motion pictures (laughs) that when you don't know how to fix this, you bring Christopher Walken in and he just spices things up and makes it better. Yeah, right. The Joe Dirt syndrome of, you're talking to my guy all wrong. That, But that's the thing about, like, what an amazing presence Walken has is that anytime he steps into a movie, that is where your focus is. For a moment, I was like, this movie might be okay. I know. And then he <laughs> leaves, and I kept waiting for him to come back, especially at the mm-hmm. end, you know? And it just never, ever happens, and that's really disappointing. But And also crazy, from just a narrative point of, the, of view, <laughs> why introduce this character to drop exactly one piece of information that you could get from Lewis. Yes, at the beginning of the movie. Oh, uh, it's it. Brian comes into our movie and he says, uh, Ben Affleck, I'm hungry and I couldn't help all of this talk of federal prosecutors. Fun fact, I have a brother who's a federal prosecutor. Hey, don't say forget about it. And seeing as our trio are now being watched by the cops, they all leave their safe house and drive around in Ben Affleck's convertible. Yeah. With this kidnapped individual with mental disabilities. Yeah, I mean, it's the equivalent of a Mary Craig from Psycho driving around and running into her boss at the crosswalk. Where you're like, somebody is going to see this kid. You have committed not just a federal crime in the kidnapping, but you are being hunted, as a later cameo will point out. Ben Affleck pretends that the flashlight is a phone again. He picks it up. He's like, hey, what? The pay watch is closed again today? No way. Get those guys in the ass for me. Click. Brian is terribly sad at this news. And J-Lo says, what's the pay watch? Oh, it's where the beautiful girls swim. It's real. Not like TV. You can be friends there. I think that's where the sex is. Underneath this, just to point it out yet again, this weirdly sentimental music is playing Uh as Brian is talking about this is where the sex is. Cut to Brian staring at a painted mural of a big breasted woman in a red bikini on the wall of this restaurant that has nothing but outdoor seating. Cause that's where you want to go, Bo, when the cops are looking for you with a kidnapped young adult male with mental disabilities. Who's the brother of a federal prosecutor, an open air cafe that is on the corner. So two roads go by to double the chances that someone uh, who might be looking for said handicapped younger brother might spot them. They're eating some lunch and, and those punks from Star Trek Four who play their music too loud <laughs> are there playing their music too loud. And while they're playing it, J-Lo is kind of bouncing her head a little bit and Brian is dancing. But Ben Affleck, because he is consumed by rage, it, yeah, is like, hey oh, how about you fucking kids turn down your fucking music? Fuck you, Grandpa. We'll kick your ass. Fuck me. I'm about to come over there. And J-Lo is like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> how about we don't create a scene with our kidnappy? You got a good point. Look, I'm going to handle this, okay? So she walks over to these kids and she turns off the music and she makes up this whole story about kai toy may is that not a real thing i don't think so Uh, it's probably not because it involves ripping a guy's eyeball out right yeah she says well the the thing is the genius of the move is that you not only gouge someone's eye out liquefy it with your thumb but as you remove your thumb you drive your index finger into the socket 
and with it bring not just the optical nerve, but the visual cortex. And what that does is it not only blinds you, but it removes your memory of anything you've ever seen. And not only is this a highly illegal move that cannot be taught in the United States, but it was kind of worth it to go to the Changxi province to learn how to do this move. Now, do you want to keep the music down or would you like me to demonstrate this to you? Gulp! We'll turn the music down, ma'am. All right, you kids stay in school. What she actually says to them on, on their way out. A situation that wasn't even real conflict has now been de-escalated. Right. But on his way out, though, Ben Affleck grabs one of the kid's laptops and cracks it over his knee to break it and goes, Hey, suck my dick dot com. He's one of the worst characters ever captured on film. It's crazy how unlikable he is in this movie and unconvincing. It's it's that one two punch of he's a terrible character and Ben Affleck does not play the character very well. Cut to our trio driving around with the top down and Ben Affleck says, Hey, all that, uh, that Kung Fu talk, was that real? And Jayla's like, no, you idiot. And in true Pixix fashion, Chad, uh -huh. a character references Sun Tzu's art of war to prove how smart they are. Yeah. And she says, Sun Tzu says that in war, the best victory requires no battles. Oh, well, you know, I don't like to read or nothing. That sounds pretty crazy to me. And then she pivots the conversation and she says, you seem very unhappy. <laughs> when men are little boys, they're told not to cry when they get unhappy, and they express sadness through yelling at their wives and kids. Like you yell at me and Brian all the time. What makes you so sad, Ben Affleck? Before he can answer, his mobile phone rings. He picks it up, and he says, Hello? What? I can't, ma. It's not a good time. Ma, it's not a good time. All right, Ma, I'll come over. Forget about it. We need one more character that's going to show up for a scene. This movie detours to Ben Affleck's mother's house. So he can shoot her in the ass with what? Like insulin or hormone replacement therapy? Like, I don't know what's going on here. But you do get to see that she has a pink thong going down her crack. <laughs> and she's played by Lane Kazan. I think it's her name. She was the mom in My Big Fat Greek Wedding. You say so. The mom smacks Ben Affleck upside his head after she gets her butt cheek injection. And then... <laughs> this time, it's characters we already met. J-Lo and Brian are there because Brian has to pee. They come in, Brian goes to pee, and Ben Affleck's mom starts eyeing J-Lo up and down and just staring at her like a wolf. And she's like, oh, I gotta tell you, normally he brings nothing but pigs home. Like, no, 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 I don't mean pigs. I mean insubstantial women. Also, the mom is wearing this incredibly low-cut top with her breast on full display. Yeah. She looks at J-Lo and says, you do, uh, you make a cute couple, so tell me you do sweetheart, something like that. Ma! She's a lesbian, all right? <laughs> And the mother perks up. She's like, ooh, never mind. I can I can look at this one. She's been with fellas before. But sometimes fellas have their limitations. Am I right? Am I right? Pay me no attention, Ben. Then his mother says, you know, I wasn't always just his mother. I've been with more than just a man. I had a couple of flings, you know, back in the day. And he's like, what are we even talking about here, Ma? I don't want to know about any of this. I was very... Uh, experimental life's not black and white although i like black guys and white guys and black chicks and white chicks and hispanic chicks i like everybody what the movie just detoured over so that we could get an unnecessary backstory of his mother's sexual escapades from back in the day yeah that's what's happening here and then she kisses ben affleck goodbye when they leave and then she leans in and kisses j-lo on the lips yes what it is a hell of a kiss and then she tells them Look, you two crazy kids, remember, life isn't just black and white. It's also Asian, Eastern Europeans, oh, Italians. Oh my god, this is just, we're getting into the meat of this movie where it just gets fucking crazier scene by scene. So, they go back home. Um, let, let me just, let me jump real quick. Please. This movie feels like if you had given the script to john waters or david lynch or somebody who just makes batshit crazy movies it might have been it was it would have been better <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it stays between the lines so much but then it just periodically like veers off into that part of the road that goes and then you go oh god i fell asleep for a moment i almost died all right i'll pay attention 
And then... You know, say what you will about the politics of Chasing Amy. Chasing Amy is a movie about that relationship. This is a movie about... No relationships. Yeah, I mean... Like you said, there are just moments where all of a sudden we're veering into sexual identity territory and then immediately jerk back. Only that seems to be kind of the point of the movie. Anyway, we'll get to it, but it's nuts. But again, we're about to get to one of the centerpiece scenes of this. They go back home. <laughs> Brian is listening to more weather from Australia and he takes the phone away from him. He's like, the fuck are you doing? Listen, I'm sorry about this, but I just like her voice. And the music here tells us that this is a sweet moment that we should appreciate. And for no good reason, Ben Affleck is like, all right, just try to keep it under control or whatever. And hands the phone back to him. He's like, all right, I will keep it under control. Restraint is a hallmark of my personality back in the living room it's nighttime ben affleck walks in and creepily starts watching j-lo do yoga so i'm uh i'm not your type you're more woman than i know what to do with <laughs> yeah but you said earlier at my mom's house that uh, you've been with guys and uh they have their shortcomings <laughs> she says yeah they're terrible at giving head which you know fair but then he's like you know maybe your problem is you haven't been with the kind of guys who know how to get pearls when they go oyster diving if you get my drift wink wink he says actual dialogue you girls are at a natural disadvantage years of evolution made men to satisfy a woman we lead the back that's why you lesbians spend all your dough on sexual appliances and erotic monkey wrenches. Because they ain't got what I got. The penis. Jennifer Lopez says... You take this one. I'm just going to sit back. <laughs> she says, so you think <laughs> the penis is the height of sexual evolution? And he's like, of course. Right. Huh. <laughs> well, let's stop and think about this. And then she gives, I'm not going verbatim here. It is this entire monologue, Chad, about the beauty of the female form, the legs and the hips and everything. She says, and then consider the penis. It looks like a sea slug or maybe just a big toe. And she says, when you're making love, the first impulse is to kiss lips, full, wet, sensuous lips. And what is the analog to the lips? Not the toe, not a sea slug, the vagina. That is the analog to the human mouth. This speech goes on way too long. And the whole time she's doing yoga and spreading her legs and arching her back. And honestly, there was a similar speech given in the movie Scent of a Woman that I think works much better than this one. Well, yeah, because at the end of this speech, Ben Affleck... It, 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 he's watching her as she's doing the yoga and she kind of wraps up her monologue with i am talking of course about the thing that everyone is trying to get to to be enveloped by that is fascinated with that i am proud to call my pussy and he gives this shake of the head like oh you got me this time jennifer lopez this is nuts what are we even talking about in this movie I don't know. He's just standing there kind of slack jawed with a big boner in his pants. <laughs> right. He's just all horned up for her, even more so. And again, when you get into the sexual politics, he is ogling a lesbian who has made it clear she has no interest in him and is explaining and getting him to agree with the fact that women are preferable to both of them. She spends the rest of the movie emasculating yeah you paused for a moment there i'm gonna give you like five or six moments that it's she just turns him into a woman it's not so much just a an emasculation like she's completely removing his penis it is the gender she is flipping the gender role of the movie we'll get to yeah it. so brian goes in to pick up the phone to call australia and see if it's raining or not but before he can dial a phone call is coming in but it doesn't ring and he picks it up and it's larry on the phone and larry says who is this who is this who the fuck is this i don't find this funny is this the retard? <laughs> you're like oh my god like oh it's so bad ben f like he walks in and takes the phone and he's like it's like real like who's on first only use the line who's on first over and over again it's like who the fuck is this who the fuck is this who the fuck are you who the fuck are you and then finally 
Ben Affleck figures that he's like, oh shit, it's my boss. His boss says, okay, we're not getting the results we want. Tomorrow, I want you to send Brian's thumb to the federal courthouse to apply a little more pressure, all right? Cut off his thumb, put it in the mail, send it express day delivery. I think that's what it's called. You fucking dummy. Enough already. All right. Put the clam liquor on. That's a dialogue from this movie. Uh Uh-huh. Moral of the story being... Hey, we're about to have to cut off a thumb and send it to the courthouse so that we escalate this situation. And Ben Affleck is understandably a little bit put off by the idea. Who wouldn't be? You got to cut off a person's thumb? I mean, who wouldn't be like any other gangster from any other movie you ever saw? Uh, I don't know, man. Cut off somebody's thumb and being responsible for keeping them alive. That's going to be a mess. Joe Pesci would just cut off the thumb. Okay, okay, okay. Funk. Ah! We're done. All right? Okay, okay. He would drive to his mother's house for dinner with this kid in the trunk, you know? (laughs) And anyway, but as soon as he hangs up the phone, Brian is like, excuse me, Ben Affleck. I've been thinking about things, and I think I want to stay here with you. You're such a reasonable sort and i feel as though we've grown quite close i thought about the idea and and i wanted to let you know i'm going to give you not just one thumbs up but two thumbs up you're a real two thumbs up kind of guy ben affleck and tomorrow we should go to the baywatch how about uh i go to bed you read to me a little bit more and we'll call it a day and so, sure enough, Ben Affleck reads the Charmin package to uh, coax him to sleep. Because even though he now has access to a book, because Jennifer Lopez has at least one on her, we know, he decides <laughs> instead to read the toilet paper <laughs> to him. So J-Lo and Ben Affleck, they climb into bed and J-Lo says, so uh, do you have any friends? And Ben Affleck says, I ain't got no friends. I'm a loner, daddy, a rebel. Also, uh, we got to cut the kid's thumb off tomorrow. Cut to the next morning where we get to see Brian dancing in the kitchen to the song Everything's Gonna Be Alright by Naughty by Nature. Mm -hmm. And Brian's dancing looks like the dancing of a five-year-old at a wedding. There's lots of spastic knee bend pops, uh, a lot of arms punching in and out. And Ben Affleck wakes up to this music. He goes into the kitchen where he hears Brian say, Matt Ups to my homies, Miss Friedman, Lily, Mr. Mossman, and the guy he plays cards with, and all my peeps at Wilshire Adult Care, and big ups to the cafeteria workers, and Ben Affleck and J-Lo, big ups to them as well. It's a real like, hey, we're going to rattle off all the people that work in the lunchroom and so forth. I know this is playing for charming, but it's like, oh, right, he needs to be taken care of and not just left to his own devices in Ben Affleck's apartment. They're going to come in, it's going to be on fire. Yeah, right. So Ben Affleck is up and about, and he's kind of got no time for this. And then... I got neighbors, all right? (laughs) And then, Bo... Ah, Christ, who's at the door? Hey, everybody, let's see who's who's at the door this time. <laughs> Why, well, it appears to be a blonde lesbian. We meet a character, we're going to find her name's Robin. In it. And Robin looks at Ben Affleck and she says, Who the fuck are you? To which he responds, Who the fuck are you? Yeah, who the fuck am I? Who the fuck are you? She barges in. She's like, what a shithole. Where's J-Lo? J-Lo comes in wearing a towel because she just got out of the shower. And J-Lo says, look, this is a professional situation, Robin. And Robin is livid. She says, I can't believe this. You were the fucking man. You know what, Ben Affleck? You can blow me. Because she's a lesbian. Two things I enjoy hearing a woman say that makes me laugh every time is blow me and suck my dick. I think both of those are very funny. The only movie I can ever think of where a woman said the latter was G.I. Jane. I know women in my personal life who have said that in my presence, and I found it charming. You have very interesting relationships with the women in your world. (laughs) I like to think so. (laughs) So, Robinson, she's all freaked out, and she says, I can't believe this. You were the fucking man. I'm not going to leave this apartment. He's leaving. I'm going to leave. You're going to get the fuck out now. Is this what you want, Jennifer Lopez? For all three of us to have sex? J-Lo jumps in. She says, look, Robin, this is over. We're over. At which point, Robin walks to the kitchen, Uh grabs a knife from the silverware drawer, (laughs) and slits not one, but two wrists. Can I tell you what I thought was going to happen at this point? The the aliens were truly (laughs) going to show up and abduct Brian? No, I thought she was going to die. They were going to throw her in the tub to hide her body and use her thumb for Brian's. And instead, that's not what happens at all. They just take her to the hospital. Why did Ben Affleck take the kid he had just kidnapped to the hospital where there are police and security guards? 
at least they wait in the car, I guess. Yeah. And inside the hospital, you can see JLo saying goodbye to her ex, Robin, who now has bandaged wrists. But we met this character 37 seconds ago. Yeah, there's a lot of history that these two have that we'll never get to know and also don't care about. Ben Affleck is in the car with Brian and he's looking on seeing JLo say her goodbyes. And Ben Affleck says, she's some fucking woman and brian says yes she's like the women on baywatch those women make my penis sneeze hey that's pretty fucking funny you know god bless you what i mean that's so nice that's one of the nicest things hey thank you sincerely thank you and then brian says what do you say no are you stupid no i'm i was talking to my penis because it sneezed and i was saying god bless you to that but i guess if you've taken some sort of comfort from it then by all means. So did Brian have an orgasm while sitting in the passenger seat of this convertible? The implication is not that he did then, but that he's definitely cranking it on that couch at night. Thinking about toilet tissue and Tabasco sauce. <laughs> right. Read, read <laughs> me the thing about rubbing bottoms again. Just when you thought our movie couldn't surprise you anymore, it immediately does. As JLo comes out of the hospital and says, hey, Ben Affleck, what if we sneak down to the morgue, cut a thumb off a corpse, and we'll send that to the federal prosecutors? Are you with me? And he's like, uh, sure. No, no, I don't want to hear a sure. There is a difference between sure and yes. What I want is a yes. If, you, if I ask you to move, like, hey, can you come help me move a couch? And you say, sure, that's what I expect. But what I'm looking for is a response similar to if I said, I want to say, I don't know, spend the next 12 hours sucking your dick. And I would expect that's a yes. And he's like, oh, yeah, uh, ask me again. So she says, so will you, are you in this with me? And he says, yes. Does this also include the 12 hour blowjob? It's, uh, it's again, one of those things where in a different movie, him saying like, ask me again, and then saying yes, would have some emotional weight. It just doesn't. There's no reason for these two characters to have any emotions towards one another at all, other than Jennifer Lopez feeling vague tolerance for Ben Affleck and for him to just be horny for her. A 12-hour blowjob? Yeah. That seems like a real long time. I assume there are some breaks in there. Oh. And I'm going to need a Gatorade. So then our movie turns into a sitcom-style caper where they go down to the morgue and they sneak past the desk attendant. J-Lo's the distraction. And then Ben Affleck and Brian, of course they would take him with them. They go into the actual morgue itself. And Ben Affleck cuts the thumb off of a dead guy using a plastic knife that came with some nearby takeout. I don't know how that happened. While Brian sings Baby Got Back acapella in the corner. And as he finishes up, Brian says, I don't know if you are listening, but that song is old school. Like you, sir. You are old school. And then that's it. They, now they've got their thumb and they take it to a UPS store, uh -huh. presumably the next day. Right. Where as they're packaging this up or Ben Affleck is like pulling it out of his pocket and putting it in, the, in this package. He just tosses it in a manila <laughs> envelope. Yeah. Just clunk. And Jennifer Lopez is giving fuck eyes to the girl behind the counter. She's a lesbian too. Yeah. Well, as we learn, Ben Affleck notices what's going on between these two people. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on here? How come you don't look at me like that? You look at her the way that my mom used to look at her breast friend Angelina. Oh, wait a second. Hold on. I'm starting to <laughs> oh, realize a lot of things about Angelina right now. <laughs> he asks her, are, what, are you two friends or something? And she says, yeah, close, personal. And he's like, oh, I'm so seething right now. Let's get out of here. So they get in the car mm -hmm. and he has yet another monologue in this movie where he says, you know what you were saying the other day about me being sad? Yes, I am filled with sadness right now. You know why? Because you're gay and because you are great. You are this amazing, sexy woman. You're like a 17 on a 10 point scale. And not only that, I like you. I never thought that was possible for me to relate to a woman on an emotional level, but I did. I kind of like you, but you are untouchable. You are this untouchable thing in a castle of lesbianism he calls her a dicosaurus rex and a stone cold dyke well he's uh, flirting her up he's known her for 48 hours <laughs> they have nothing in common yeah he's upset because a woman that he met 
two days ago won't have sex with him. And also pointed out the fact that his life just sucks in general. Yes. And J-Lo looks at him and the expression on her face is just pity Uh and sadness. And I think she also realizes I might be able to have a good time with this crybaby. (laughs) Right. I'm going to throw him a pity fuck. But I'm going to make him earn it. Yeah. So we're back at Ben Affleck's house and Brian is watching Lancelot Link on Nick at Night. The best talking monkey show ever made if you ask me Mm -hmm. we cut to j-lo in the bedroom she's freshly showered and she's looking at ben affleck and she says so do your fingernails need trimming i'm like "Uh oh bo (laughs) and ben affleck extends his arm out in front of him and bends his hand backward with his fingers up to look at his fingernail kind of as if he's like stopping traffic right he's like what these nails forget about it the boyfriend and then j-lo starts the emasculation once again but she's like you know people who are more balanced toward the masculine check their nails this way and she curls her fingers in like a a semi-fist palm facing you and she's like but those that are more feminine do that thing where you just extended your arm out and gaze at them from a distance which i asked my wife how she looks at her nails and it was the long arm way and i do the curl in. ask my son he does the curl in so The theory holds up in my household. I kind of disagree a little bit that it's about emasculating him. And it's more to say that he has sort of a feminine energy. But And that's only to say that I still think it's stupid that the movie is trying to say because Ben Affleck has a feminine energy that makes it okay for her to fuck him even though she's a lesbian her next question Bo, is are you gay and he's like oh, blah, 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 me, me me gay i'm not gay i can't even be gay i don't even know what gay means gay me gay forget about it forget about it what huh no hey i mean if you're saying am i happy no i answered that question earlier i'm anti-gay wait i don't maybe that's not the right way to put it i never even i I never even thought about giving somebody a 12-hour blowjob until you mentioned it earlier and that's all i can think about now every guy we pass on the street i'm thinking would i blow him for 12 hours maybe three hours tops at this point Bo, again as this happened at least half a dozen times i was like oh here's where our movie's gonna go and i expected the film to now be about Ben Affleck's character coming to terms with the fact that he's gay but that doesn't happen it gives you a head fake and it goes to a place that I did not expect right so they end up kissing here no she kisses him yeah and he says that's important right and he says you need the woman and she says oh I've got one and she also tells him I thought you wanted to be my bitch and she pinches his nipple so hard right the bit of like recoils in pain and again I think there is there is plenty of room for a movie to kind of explore a dynamic in a relationship where the woman is more assertive and more dominant in the relationship and you've got a man who's more submissive and takes on traditional female roles this just ain't the movie for it wasn't that Mr. Mom or my super ex-girlfriend? Nah, I mean, to be actual, actually thoughtful about it and not just do these kind of lazy stereotypes, which is what's happening here. You remember that episode of Too Close for Comfort where Monroe, as played by Jim J. Bullock, an openly gay man in real life, uh, got raped by two women? <laughs> yes, I do remember that. <laughs> Imagine the idiot guys who wrote that. We're going to deal with the sensitive subject matter of rape. By having a man who is clearly a homosexual being raped by two women. Not great. Monroe. <laughs> it, <laughs> you had that cosmic cow puppet? I Like, I don't know too close for comfort. Or the work <laughs> of Jim J. Bullock. It, it's just a bizarre scene to put in this movie. And, it, and the dynamic of their relationship is just so strange. Because it's not as if, you know, he's discovering that he's always secretly wanted to be a woman. And then that is a thing. It's just he has a feminine bent. But also why... Says who? Says J-Lo. Right. He doesn't do anything feminine in this movie at all. Well, mm, He looks at his nails like, like I, that doesn't count. She's pinching his nipples and slapping him around and <laughs> telling him to put on makeup and a dress. <laughs> yeah, now we're talking. <laughs> um. And then here, she lays on her back and she's, she's like, uh, all right, it's turkey time. She spreads her legs and says, gobble, gobble. <laughs> Again, if a woman that you were involved with said that to you, you'd be like, what are you, what are you talking about? Turkey? Do you want me to eat you out? Why don't you just say that? Um, 
But anyway, they end up fucking. This is one of those moments where, like, Jennifer Lopez is laying on her back, and it's almost that John Lennon album cover where Ben Affleck is curled against her in the traditionally feminine position. Yeah, but when they have sex, it's also important to note that she flips him over and gets on top of him, uh-huh. and she's kind of smacking him around a little bit, and we get some sexy acoustic guitar to know that this is romantic sex, and no one's going to get hurt. And they're also mostly clothed. <laughs> like, what? what is this, a Spike Lee movie? Come on. <laughs> a Spike Lee movie. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just very frustrating, because, again, I think there is an interesting movie to be made about a relationship that has, like, swapped gender roles like this and and the way that makes the man feel and the way that makes the woman feel and how they navigate that but it i mean i'm talking about like a cassavetes movie and this is just not that boomerang did that Mm, no with with robin gibbons remember she was all dominant and but that's the most like stereotypical binary way to look at it and i think there's a more interesting movie to be made that is like i said this is not the film and this is not the filmmaker to do it i mean i'm talking about like a chloe Zhao film or something like that when they're canoodling after sex j-lo says you know every relationship has a bull and a cow and then ben affleck moves because he's the cow that's right and she says you know when this gig's over i'm leaving he's like oh that's just what we call pillow talk baby when you're like hey i'm glad you enjoyed this but i'm fucking off as soon as this is over with so maybe i've awakened some things in you that you have to deal with but that ain't my problem the next morning the phone rings it's lenny who says you and j-lo meet me at beverly and lomitas all right and don't break the thing because he refers to brian as the thing yeah first i thought maybe he's a little cautious because their phone lines may be monitored but then i realized he just views brian as a literal thing and not a human that's pure sociopathy and that's what you need to be to be a a gangster like this you can't actually think you're taking human lives j-lo and benefleck they go to meet lenny and they're driving in their car and on their way benefleck says you know i uh i got this fantasy and j-lo immediately says to make it with a guy yeah what he's like i'm not gay i don't think Look, I just want to go someplace clean where there's no scumbags telling you what to do. Yeah. Someplace you can just be yourself, you know? No bad stuff. What is going on? Also, the, we've never seen him do anything bad. Yes, I mean, the work that he's in, uh, I mean, aside from kidnapping this kid, but like in terms of murdering people, like he shook one guy down and didn't and put him in a dryer. And he's babysitting an adult. Right, who he is, because uh, according to the music, is starting to feel an attachment to. I, again, I mean, is he a good person? No, he's kind of a shitball. But this idea of like, I need to get clean like what were you uh, you know assaulted by your father or something like none of this makes any sense anyway lenny shows up he's looking pissed off he's always looking pissed off and lenny says yeah we've uh we got a visitor from new york follow me so they follow lenny in his car and they arrive at this beautiful home where boat Winner of the Academy Award for Best Act in a Motion Picture, one Mr. Al Pacino walks into our movie. He is wearing a gray suit that is not tailored to him. It's way too baggy. His shirt is a little too big. His tie is loose. He has salt and pepper hair that's just long enough that it can be pulled into one of those douchebag three-inch ponytails. He has a goatee. And everyone on screen looks as shocked to see Al Pacino enter this movie as we, the audience, are shocked to see him enter this movie. Yeah. I don't think they told him that he was going to be playing this part because they're looking at each other like, that's fucking Al Pacino. Ben Affleck and J-Lo both have the same expression I did, which was like, wait, what's happening now? And and Pacino is Starkman, the guy who's being prosecuted on the federal level, which is what led to the kidnapping of Brian, if you haven't paid attention to anything we're saying, which I don't fault you for doing. And Pacino comes in and he, it's full Pacino. I mean, he's just like, hoo come in, come in, take a seat, grab a couch. Sit, sit. I say everything twice. I'm like that guy from Goodfellas. hoo I just got in from New York. I'm a little jet lag. I'm guessing Lewis here told you I got a little bit of legal troubles right now. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Tell you what I'm not going to do, and that's go to jail. Everyone is confused. Yeah. And Pacino goes on and he says, somewhere there's been a mistake. You see, some people don't consider the thumb to technically be a finger. Lewis looked up the definition of the thumb. Turns out it's a digit. 
not a finger hoo <laughs> Yeah, and it, he's like, I had this one over here. Look it up in the dictionary. Turns out they called it a digit two. Pacino walks over to Lewis and he's eating cookies or snacks out of a little bag. And Pacino reaches inside Lewis's coat and removes a gun. And Pacino says, Lewis, I've been subpoenaed. I can't associate with armed felons. A little consideration, please. Guns intimidate from the outside. But you can also intimidate from the inside. And the most intimidating person is someone who doesn't give a shit. Who? Uh... <laughs> Lewis, let me ask you a question. Do you want to go to medical school? Kabam! And he shoots Lewis in the head, blowing his brains into a saltwater fish tank with all of these exotic fish that swim around and eat this guy's brains and uh -huh. Ben Affleck and J-Lo are in shock as was I the same movie where you saw a mentally ha handicapped adult sing baby got back uh-huh while dancing around in a morgue also goes this direction too how did you not love this terrible terrible movie <laughs> Pacino he goes full Pacino here and he's like, yeah, feel like I'm floating. <laughs> like, I don't give a shit. I got no compunctions, none whatsoever. I'm concerned about the way things turned out here. Let me ask you a question. How was the bleeding? Ben Affleck's like, uh, the bleeding? And, and, and he's looking over at Lewis and Pacino sitting on the couch now eating the same snacks that Lewis was eating just a moment ago. He's like, oh, not Lewis, the retard. How was the bleeding when you cut off his thumb? And Ben Affleck's just like, hey, the bleeding, forget about it. It was fine. And Pacino just stares at Lewis's dead body. And he says, okay, good. I didn't need your help, Lewis. I gotta beat these charges. You were gonna extort a federal prosecutor? I kidnapped your little brother. And so the charges are gonna be dropped? You didn't think that every fed would drop what they're doing and dive in to protect one of their own? Wake up! This is the 21st fucking century! It's not Little Italy! And as he's giving this pacino monologue blood is dripping from the bullet wound in lewis's head over his eye and dripping down his cheek it's a scorsese moment man it's crazy there are moments in this movie that are very good but it is you really have to pick through a lot of garbage to find them and this is a good scene yeah because pacino calms down he goes from rage to science and he's like now things are bad whether you call it a thumb or a finger or a digit, a thumb has a fingerprint, and the one you sent had the wrong one! And Flake's like, Mr. Strugman, I know my fucking name, you <laughs> piece of shit! You don't try to extort a federal fucking prosecutor, and if you do, you don't fuck around! And at the moment you think... He is about to shoot Ben Affleck. Would have been a better movie. But if he had killed both of them right now it w in the credits, it would have been great. Yes. Jennifer Lopez says, fuck this. And he's like, huh? And she says, look, we had to disobey that order because it was a bad request. Now, sometimes when someone above you gives you an order that you know is going to go counter to the interests of your employer, you have to make kind of a game time decision. And that's what we did there. And in fact, if you were to give me an instruction right now to do something that is not in your best interest, it would be upon me to make a decision to protect you whether you knew that or not. So having this kid being picked up to tell the police about being kidnapped would not be beneficial to anyone, right? And that's what would happen if you were to kill us right now. Who uh What we want to do is remove this thorn from your side. Who uh And make it so that this kid can never testify to anyone about anything again. Who uh and then, if that doesn't work out for you, -ah. then we can all come back here and sit down and talk again. -ah. Cut to Ben Affleck and J-Lo and Brian in the convertible, just driving away. We are, what, 10 minutes away from the end of this movie? Yes. It's crazy. So, yeah, and they're just like, okay, well, we're going to take Brian. Drop him off at the home. Yeah. 
so Brian in the back seat sings I Need Love by LL Cool J. Sure. Ben Affleck says, So uh Brian, let me ask you a question. Since I'm about to drop you off and never see you again for the rest of my life, do you have a girlfriend or something? Of course not. I don't have a girlfriend. Well look, uh maybe I can give you one thing, you know, before we uh part ways and whatnot. What you do is a, a thing that people have been talking about and you know, it's been kind of rattling around my head. I think this is probably true. What you need to do is just man up and do the thing that you're scared of doing so if you see a girl you like you go up to her and you say hello how are you it's nice weather we're having ain't it so say it all right i'll, I'll try it out hello how are you it's nice weather we're having you did such a great job there anyway now to drop you off so that you can never use this information they stop to get gas and ben affleck says to j-lo look look now that we're partners in crime um why don't you tell me your real name? Because that's something you mentioned an hour earlier in the movie that didn't ever come up again. And she's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. So J-Lo says, look, Ben Affleck, the whole man thing doesn't do it for me. I am a lesbian. But somehow I felt bad for you. Pity was really what it was in the end. I can't be what it is you really want. Mm -hmm. Which I was like, are you saying you're a lesbian and you can't be with a straight guy? Or are you going back to that, hey, I think you're gay and I'm not a man? Who knows? Here's how you solve this. This whole thing is you just make her openly bi. Oh yeah, I, you know, here I prefer people of both sexes. It makes no difference to me, but I just don't like you. That wasn't a thing when this movie came out that was openly discussed. They were people in America were just comfortable with Ellen DeGeneres yeah. being an open lesbian. Right. And that's kind of the problem of the movie is that it can only speak in very simplistic terms about these things. And it just doesn't have the moves to be nuanced about any of it. It was ahead of its time, Bo. Look, this movie is not a mark of progress for anyone or anything. So they all hop in the car, head down the Pacific Coast Highway. They're going to go drop Brian off at his home. And as they're rolling along there is a movie shoot happening over on the beach full of women and men in bathing suits with surfboards and brian sees this the music swells with stringed instruments brian says oh my god oh my god they're open the bay watch is open hello i can't believe it we have to stop we have to stop and ben affleck being such a dick he's just like nah we're not gonna stop yeah and he just drives right back at the end of the movie when he's like just had this touching moment with brian he's just like eh forget it and then j-lo gives him a look like what are you doing he's like oh wait you would like that all right i'm done right <laughs> so they park they walk over to the beach and brian stares at all of these people getting ready for the filming and brian says can i go down there please i i ben affleck you promised me can i please go down there and ben affleck says nah i don't even think that's the real bay watch i think it's something else just for five minutes you did promise hey you know what bro what's your, what's your brother's name brian uh, my brother and his name? Well, it's Stinky. I'll tell you all about that another time. It's Stinky Jimmy Dorf, because sometimes he smells like fish. <laughs> I came up with that nickname. I'm a genius. Anyway, yeah, so uh, he's like, yeah, you guys uh, wait right here or something. Ben Affleck goes over to this payphone, calls the U.S. courthouse, and asks for, you know, the older brother. Stinky Jimmy Dorf? Yeah. Hey, your brother's down here at the Baywatch. We're on Pacific Coast Highway. It's a film shoot. He'll be wandering around, probably with sneeze in his pants. You're right. <laughs> and the music tells us this is a real emotional moment. I guess if you say so, Geely. He walks back over to Brian, who looks at Ben Affleck and he says, I think you're wrong. That is the Baywatch. And Jennifer Lopez, she says, take good care of yourself, Brian. She kisses Brian on the forehead. Then Brian leans in and kisses Ben Affleck on the cheek and says, you take good care of yourself, Ben Affleck. And then we get a call back to the fingernail thing where Ben Affleck says, hey, hey, Brian, how your fingernails look? And he looks at him in a manly way and he's like, hey, don't give me any shit about this. Yeah. It is at this point that Ben Affleck says, you know what, Brian, why don't you run along to the Baywatch? Security's probably going to throw your ass out in about 15 seconds. Brian runs off. Ben Affleck turns around to J-Lo and says, and you know what? You should take my car. I prefer if you had it. I want you to be all right. I'm like, the feds are on their way to the beach right now. You kidnapped a human being. Leave. Dude, he gives her his car. Yes. For no discernible reason. Like earlier, she was like, hey, how about you just drop me off anywhere on the Pacific Coast Highway and I'll figure it out from there? He is like, no, I'd really honestly feel better if you know 
you just took my car and then left me alone. That only makes sense if it's stolen. <laughs> right? Or or something. Or if she had ever once in the movie been like, hey, I really like this car or something. None of that happens. I think he's just trying to bribe her with anything because he says, do me a favor. As far as the lesbian thing goes, if you ever decide to hop the fence, give me a call first, okay? And then both these two passionately kiss. They're like, what? No. So J-Lo drives off in Ben Affleck's car because he's a jackass. And then Brian goes down onto the beach. He's wandering around with all of these extras for this like beach movie shoot. And the cast is called to their first position on the set. And Brian wanders among them to be part of the movie filming. And people start pairing up. And Brian ends up pairing with this blonde woman in a pink bikini. And Brian looks at her and says, it's nice weather we're having. And the woman says in an Australian accent, Yes, it is very nice, but the weather's always very nice around here. And I got to tell you, Bo, I loved this moment. I love that the callback work, I think that the music that they play is wonderfully themed because you get to see this Brian character. He is beside himself with excitement, hearing her accent, talking about the weather. Because he's like, he says, yes, there's a 10% chance of precipitation across the coastal region extending from New South Wales to Victoria. We cut to Benefleck, who's like 200 yards away, looking on with disbelief because he can't hear anything that's going on. Mm -hmm. And they start filming. The music starts thumping. Brian is dancing with all these actors. Actors, and he is having the greatest day of his life. It is the only scene in this movie, in my opinion, that makes watching it worthwhile. I love the finale of this movie of just watching this character be so happy and crazy and dancing. And he's with an Australian girl and talking about the weather. I found it to be like pitch perfect in a movie that is completely tone deaf. Yeah. I mean, again, if everything leading up to it hadn't been crap, I suppose so. As a Martin Breast moment, they, they, there are certain moments in in his movie where he pulls this off very well and even overlooking you know a person with some degree of mental disability and all of the crap around it i did think that the setup and the payoff of him calling and liking her accent and talking about the weather that all of that comes together at the end of this movie you should never watch this. Yeah, right, right, right. I said that shit at the beginning because we didn't want to be the only ones that suffer. But you should never watch this. <laughs> yeah. I, like, if you if you wanted to do a super cut of, like, the walking scene, the Pacino scene, and then this, none of it would connect. But then again, nothing in the movie connects either. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. It's kind of fine, but also it doesn't really mean anything because if you take the scene five minutes longer and it's like, oh... Hey, what is this kid doing out here? Everybody, get him off the set and uh, get him back. Oh, and then, the, and then the feds show up. Yeah. It's a full investigation. Yeah. Oh, th this kid's mentally handicapped. Somebody get him back to his home. You're having to ask him about where this thumb came from. Right, right. It's one of those things that if you extend the scene beyond the borders of the film, it falls apart pretty quickly. But yeah, it's it's as, as this movie goes, it's kind of fine. We cut to Ben Affleck. He's walking off in the sunset. And both that J-Lo immediately shows back up. She She's been gone maybe 90 seconds, long enough to get on the road, make the first U-turn she can find and come back. This is one of those moments of like, just let the movie end. Like, let her, let him have learned something. You know, I don't know exactly what that thing is, but something. Brian's happy. He's he, he's wandering off with this new life ahead of him. He has no car. Right. Well, he's going to get killed by Al Pacino. He is sleeping in a box that night. Let's be real. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Jennifer Lopez just pulls up and is like, hey, my name's Rochelle. And he's like, what the fuck are you talking about? You ask what my real name is. My real name is Rochelle. He's like, oh yeah, I mean, that's beautiful. So does this mean you decided to jump the fence? You came back, eh? Is it because I gave you my car? And, yeah, and she's like, I don't know about that. I just figured since you gave me your car, I could at least offer you a ride out of town since I kind of got you into all of this. And then she says, Bo, hey, you know what? I think you would look pretty good with mascara. And he gives her this kind of sheepdog look like, hey, what are you even talking about? Get out of here. And she says, you know, it's like your mom says, life's not always black and white. And then they drive off credits. It's, it's so bad. Yeah. I, I know. I'm just in stunned silence. I, it, it's, it is. It's crazy. I don't understand what I'm supposed to take away from this movie. I don't understand what the lesson is. 
or if there is a lesson at all. And if there's not a lesson, then what was the point of any of this? I think Bart Simpson once said, maybe there wasn't a point. Maybe it was just a bunch of stuff that happens. I, you know, I kept thinking as I was doing <laughs> notes about this movie in particular of the scene from Burn After Reading where J.K. Simmons is like, well, somebody get back to me when any of this means something. And it's that kind of thing of like, it, it, it like I said up front, it is like you took two or three movies that separately might have been pretty good. And threw them into a blender and just whipped them all together. And what came out is a movie that is just, it's too all over the place. The performance from Ben Affleck is not very good. The character is terrible. I don't understand what I'm supposed to take away from this movie. Like it's, I don't know what the, the other characters learn from one another. It's a big confusing mess of nothing. It's really bad. Like I know John Carter is the bottom for you. This is pretty close for me because I don't understand how any of this works going back to the intro when i pulled together successful directors mm -hmm. that made a terrible move that in some way kind of ended their careers but as i really looked at them these were directors that made a lot of quality films and then they made one that really you know stumbled and didn't produce like this and some of the others that i mentioned but as i've looked back on it I think that maybe some of these people were just very mature in their careers and were like, I'm, I'm kind of done. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can be the Rolling Stones and keep doing it forever and ever. Or looking at Clint Eastwood's career, you know, where he's making movies and he's like 107. You get to a point where you're just like, I'm good. I got a few nickels in the bank. Like, I, I don't really want to make movies anymore. So I don't know if it was so much that these terrible movies ended their careers, they decided to just quit making movies. When I think about Martin Brest, because truly, I think every single movie he made, excluding this one, I could watch him any day of the week. As I said, I think if Martin Brest came back and said he was going to be making another movie, I would absolutely be interested, especially if he wasn't writing it. I don't think that this should have ended Martin Brest's career. I don't agree with that kind of door slamming for a creator like that. What I'm saying is that I think he slammed the door. Or I'm curious too, as you mentioned in your introduction, I would love to hear him talk about what the movie was supposed to be and what it what happened to it along the way. Like how did it how did it come to this state? I think in that interview in 2021, this was not a subject that came up. I think it was more of a celebration of his career rather than and let's talk about the one movie that you know yeah. you smirched your otherwise perfect record. It would still be interesting for me as a fan of Martin Brest. I would like, I, w I just want to know like what, what happened with this movie or was this the movie that he intended to put out? And But what do we got coming up on episode five of this season's theme? Bombs away. Oh man. All right. We're, we're getting back into 90 minute territory. Yes. Yeah. With a comic book. Mars needs moms too. No. Mars needs more as moms. <laughs> No, we're, we're, we're staying on this planet mostly oh. with, <laughs> uh, I mean, we're getting a little supernatural for sure in a comic book adaptation featuring Ryan Reynolds and Jeff Bridges, which on paper sounds kind of interesting Yes, and in practice is really, really bad. And if I also told you, Hey, also Kevin Bacon is in this. That sounds pretty good. And then you watch the movie, which is called R.I.P.D., and you realize, like, <laughs> oh, no, this is terrible. Well, even the premise of it, it's men in black, but with dead people instead of a Everything about this movie on paper should work. This is a layup of a movie. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. It's really bad. This is a, 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 a coming from a time when everyone thought CGI was a great idea and it wasn't. But there's a lot more problems than just bad CGI. But we're not going to reveal what those problems are. <laughs> not in this episode. You got to come back to listen to R.I.P.D. Alright. So, as always, like, rate, review. You can send us an email at picksixmovies at gmail.com. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on Sheely. You put this movie on your head, your tongue would slap your brains out trying to get to it. Hooah! <laughs>